If you've been keeping up with the news of recent weeks, you know that there has been a recent announcement of another update to OpenAI's product of ChatGPT. This is not the only technology company that is interacting with and developing databases and platforms for the use of artificial intelligence, but they understandably and appreciatively are certainly some of the most well-known. Their latest release is known as ChatGPT 4.0, not 4.0, 4.0. This isn't an updated model. It's 4.0 in the sense that O in the title stands for omni. Omni means all or universal. And they reference this because it is a point of which they are using different modes and mediums to capture information and to inform a data set that then when called upon without virtually any lag time might be able to present to you the information you're asking about. Any number of things that you care to know or interact with accordingly. And this has honestly caused people with the discussion about artificial intelligence some curiosity and others some concern. Uh, Curiosity on the sort of the most ultimate end of the contemplative spectrum are those who are wondering if this is the pathway to utopia. A utopia where we can imagine a future where such artificial intelligence is deployed for our good in such a way that we can eventually identify anything such as the cause of allergies to disease and that could be eradicated from the DNA code and that in the future processes we would have no children more than any birth defects without any allergies or any kind of disabilities. It would simply be a sense by which all suffering could be addressed. That's on the curious side of the optimistic understanding of this, on the more concerned side of the spectrum of the creative use of artificial intelligence is sort of a terminator type of prophecy of what to come in the future where artificial intelligence reaches its own state of control and sort of the machines take over and nuclear holocaust is waiting for us. It's not a question of if, it's a question of when, and if not in your generation, then the generation that follows And everywhere in between, the technology, if nothing else, is itself fascinating. It has caused some people to ask the question, can we just simply say no? Can we sort of walk away from it? And there are those out there, there's plenty of YouTube videos to document this, who want to live sort of, if you will, off the grid. You know... Not simply put your phone wrapped in aluminum foil so the radio frequencies can't get to you or you to them, but actually to be away from where all other sort of power infrastructure is available to you, that they can't capture information, they do not know where to geotag you, there's no sort of systems or software apps tracking you and making recommendations that you're eerily like, I feel like I was just having that conversation about lawn chairs, and now here's an ad for lawn chairs. I'm concerned. And so the question is, what can we do? Can we live off the grid and sort of opt out as if it's an unsubscribe feature from artificial intelligence? Can I just unsubscribe from this and choose thank you, but no thank you? I might not be as informed as others of you, but at least I'll be free unlike others of you. All of this has made me think this past week about what it's like not to live with artificial intelligence, but to live with divine intelligence. The true omni, if you will. The true all-encompassing. God's world, God's place, God's time, God's presence. Is there an option for any one of us here to sort of click unsubscribe? to opt out of the marketing preferences, if you will, being delivered to our inbox, so to speak, of life. Well, I have truly imagined if that was your desire, you probably would not be here this morning. I imagine there's a lot of people who are not intending to go to any church for their desire to kind of elect to opt out of God. Thank you, but no thank you. 
being polite to moms and grandmas all over the place, nevertheless saying, I will choose to go my own way. I will choose to live in my own world. Well, the creative reality of that is that's a world of your own imagination. Because unlike technology, which can be debated as to how close or far you can be from it, the question is, what about God? What about living in God's world? Can you really actually pull that off? We'll learn this morning from the scriptures. No matter how much you might want to choose to believe otherwise, you cannot pull that off. We see that God is all-present, all-knowing, and all-powerful. The main point of what we'll be learning this morning in a variety of texts is this. Only God is all-knowing, all-present, and all-powerful. This is encouraging for the child of God, and this is terrifying for the one who is not. Really, your understanding of the attributes of God really comes down to your relationship to that God. Dismiss them, deny them, redefine them, perhaps, might be an option that some would choose to try to pursue, all as an attempt to try to essentially become their own God. In the same way that a kindergartner can declare themselves the teacher of the classroom, creating a figment of their imagination, yet with a lot less adorable smiles along the way. We have learned in previous weeks in our series that God has no origin, no beginning. He does not need any helpers, and he does not change. He determines, and he does. He acts, and nothing prevents him. Because why? Because he is God does whatever he pleases. You breathe his air, you walk in his, on his planet, you live in his world. You can deny him all you want, but it nevertheless does not change his being. Which comes to this morning, we want to look at these three aspects of God's personhood. First of all, our God is all-knowing. Our God is all-knowing. This is what sometimes is known theologically as a term omniscient. This idea, or excuse me, of omni, om, omniscient. Omniscient is this idea of God being all-knowing. He has all knowledge. The triune Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, by his nature is omniscient. Saying it differently, think of it like this. God has never learned anything. There's been no update to God. Nothing that can be known that he doesn't already know. God is not a student of anyone. He's not a student of history. Not a student of humanity. God knows everything. He does not wake up in the morning looking at the news feeder, reading the, reading the daily newspaper and being informed. Listen to what the prophet Isaiah says in Isaiah chapter 40. Verses 13 and 14. Who has measured the spirit of the Lord? Or what man shows him his counsel? Whom did he consult? And who made him understand? Who taught him the path of justice and taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? God never sat in the classroom and had to follow a laser pointer. He never subscribed to some master class on how to be God, how to run his world. There is no subject that God can be advised of. Every creature, every place, every star, every cave, every cell, every desire, every thought, all of it, he knows all of it. And not only does he know all things, he knows all things equally Perfectly. Let me be clear what I'm saying. God does not know all subjects a little bit. God knows all things exhaustively so. There are some of you who have academic degrees in particular areas of industry. Engineering. Medicine. Marketing. Business analytics. And you know because of the trade by which you have applied yourself to, both academically and professionally, you know things that others of us do not know. In fact, some of you know things that I don't even know, like even read your textbooks. I like that, that sounds important. In fact, some of you, when you tell us your job title, others of us go, 
um, what is that? What exactly do you do? I don't even know what the title, let alone what it is that you do. But even for the most intelligent of you in any one area of specialty, no one in here knows everybody's specialty exhaustively, let alone just sort of cursory in a light way. But God, God hasn't just done post-doctorate work in every industry. God knows everything. He knows all things of all things. Listen how the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 41 Referencing God, how God sort of mocks these other supposed gods which don't exist. In Isaiah 41, verses 21 and 23, it says, Set forth your case, says the Lord. Bring your proofs, says the king of Jacob. Let them bring them and tell us what is to happen. Tell us the former things, what they are, that we may consider them, that we may know their outcome, or declare to us the things to come. Tell us what is to come hereafter, that we may know that you are God. Do good or do harm that we may be dismayed and terrified. The prophet Isaiah is coming up against the other nations and the Israelites who are tempted to follow the nation and say, go ahead, tell us these supposed deities. Tell us the future. They're so divine. Let us know what they can do. He continues in chapter 42 in verse 9. It says, Behold, the former things have come to pass. New things I now declare before they spring forth. I tell you of them. Now, here's the mind-blowing thing. It's not just that God knows all truth as if truth were some external object that exists, as if it's like a subject matter and God's like, oh, this is interesting and he has studied it before the rest of us. He knows all of it as if truth is some other object out here away from him. Actually, truth only has its existence because of him. God is the ultimate determiner of truth. His ideas are always true. Lies are what are against his word. In the political cycle of the last, oh, six, seven years, this phrase has become popular. It's honestly nauseating, and it's been, kind of made its way into pop culture. This phrase, your truth versus my truth. It's such a mockery, honestly, of us as a society that we're so subjective in our reference point. The only person this really applies to is the Lord. Truth is relative to God in the sense that it has no existence apart from God. It is God. It is because of God that it is true. I wonder how many of you, I want to ask by show of hands, not because it's a bad question, but if consideration you're like me, you have a YouTube account and you subscribe to some channels. My channels are pretty eclectic. You're welcome to make fun of me. They range from like a a French music production company that does like beautiful sets of EDM playlists to Formula One racing, to this country vlog people that my wife and I like watching who like cook food in the mountains of Kazakhstan, living this like idyllic life of just tranquility where like the birds and the cats play together. It's like nothing I've ever seen. I also though subscribe to Business Insider and CNBC. They got these little six to 12 minute clips they're pretty fascinating. I'm a total sucker for these clickbait titles. How Hoka became one of the fastest growing shoe brands. Why it costs $1 million per day to run one of the world's biggest cruise ships. You could just ask Sharin, she could tell you. How the shadowy world of organized retail crime works. You're like, I want to know. Why the U.S. government is buying and destroying homes. They are? Where? I find these videos fascinating. I learn a ton, sometimes useless information. You know who doesn't subscribe to any channel? God. There's nothing that can be learned that he doesn't already know. He's not sitting up in the couch in heaven with a bag of popcorn on his lap, 
flipping through the remote of society and like, oh, that's what's happening. Fascinating. As if somehow he's been caught up in a busy day and being caught up on the affairs of the rest of the world because he's been caught up in some global issue in some part of Europe or the Caribbean or South America. Nope, that's not God. Now, just thinking about the omniscience of God, let's think about the implication for you. I'll give you one. Your prayers. Your prayers. Have you ever thought about your prayers as you telling God something? I mean, I suppose that that's true in that you're telling God something and that you are talking to God about something. You are talking to God. In that sense, it's true telling him. But not in that you're informing God something. Prayer is not about telling to God as it is about talking with God. Prayer is not about informing God as it is about interacting with God. Prayer is not telling God something as it no, it's more about you having yourself relate, relationally interact with God and saying, God, you know what I want to talk to you about. In fact, as the scripture says, you know it before it's even on the tip of my tongue. Well, the question should be, well, does that mean we shouldn't pray? Friend, what were you thinking prayer was about? Updating God? Think about that for me for a second. If you are praying to a God who's being updated by you, is that cause in the question, the concern that that same God who does not know might not be able to do something about what you're telling him about? In fact, isn't the very idea of his omniscience giving you encouragement of his character that he'll act on what he knows? Not because you've been so kind to tell him, but because you're bringing it to him as one who is dependent on him. Friends, your prayers are cast into the sea of God's omniscience, not as some meaningless offering, but as a dependent conversation to say, God, I'm telling you what you know, but I am living it as you see it. Help me. Help me. Give me wisdom. Give me comfort. Give me courage. Give me compassion. Give me insight. Your prayer is rooted in the fact that you believe God knows. Additionally, not only is our God all-knowing, secondly, our God is all-present. Our God is all-present. Keeping with the omni-theme, omnipresent means God is present everywhere at all times. He's not present like a a body is present. Hey, were you at work today? Hey, did you go to class today? Did you call in the sick at, for work this past week? Your teacher wants to know if they were going to mark you absent in school. It's not present in that he is like, like a person present in the room, like you're all present here. No, it's not like that. God does not have a body. God is immaterial. God's characteristic of being present applies to both time and space. He is always present in all space and in all time at the same time because God is not limited to time. I know this is going to blow your mind, but stay with me. We often think of life from our reference point, your birth date to your death date. The time that you lived on this linear timeline from when you were born to where you're going to die and the time by which you find yourself right now on that time. And honestly, you don't even know how long that line lasts, but you think in a linear level of time and you are present right now. You're not present right now as you're present in, oh, 1999, as you're present in 2029. You're not present at those three times at the same time. It's not possible for you because you're bound by time. You are a creature. You are created in time. You are a product of what has happened in time. That's not God. God creates time. He is not bound by time. He is present in all time at the same time and present in all places at the same time. That'll keep you up at night. That'll certainly blow your mind. This is where you feel like you come to that sort of mental Grand Canyon that even I referred to in my prayer time and 
It's like you look down into it and you can't quite see the bottom of it. I perhaps I'm standing still and looking at and seeing more than I have before, but I'm not exhausting it. God being present at all times and all places is a significant point. He is everywhere and every time at the same time. No molecule, no atomic particle is so small that God is not fully present to it. And yet, there's no galaxy so large, nothing that can be looked at. There's some telescope, some exhausting place in space that God is not bigger than that. Now, for clarification, the Bible sometimes describes God as separated from his people because of their sin. You can see this in Isaiah 52. Other times, the Bible talks about God being far from the wicked. You see this in Proverbs 15. And there are even some people who wonder if hell is the one place that God is not present. Friends, each of these references in Scripture are not geographic references as they are relational references. Meaning, it's not as if God is somehow some corner of his creation and he is somehow like not in that room. He doesn't go into that closet. He doesn't enter into that wing of his creation as if he's somehow quiet there. He's absent there. No, friends, what it's saying is that what is known of him and interacting with him is different than in other places. Hell, for example, is a place where people are in perpetual suffering, pain, grief, tears, lament. Because God is present there, only displaying his attribute of justice displayed in his wrath because of those presents' rejection of him as he promised he would do. To see this in detail, turn to Psalm 139, middle of your Bible. We've heard it already. We've looked at some brief passages in Isaiah. But now let's loiter for a little bit. Psalm 139. Follow along with me as I read to you verses 1 to 18. And I want you to see it. In fact, we have an outline here for you. I want you to kind of track with it. You'll see in verses 1 to 6, God's omniscience how he knows all things. Verses 7 to 12, God's omnipresence, how he's present in all places. And in verses 13 to 18, God's omnipotence, how he can do all things, something we'll talk about more in a few minutes. Track with me here. I'm going to read to you these first 18 verses of Psalm 139. And if you don't have a Bible, you can listen along, look over the shoulder of someone, see it next to you, and know that they're for you for free at the back of the Welcome Center If you don't have a Bible that you can easily read, it's a gift from us to you. Psalm 139, to the choir master, a psalm of David, verse 1. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all together. You hem me in, behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Just stop right there. Verse six is basically saying what all of us in this room are thinking, which is, this is mind-blowing. I can't fully grasp it. It's too hard for me to really understand it. I have more questions than I have answers. But nevertheless, it's true. Now, verses 7 to 12. Looking at what's saying here is omnipresence. Where shall I go from your spirit? Where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, the Old Testament known as the place of the dead, reference to what would be known, eventually known as hell, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, 
Just ask Jonah. Verse 10, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall overcome me, shall cover me, and the light about me, night. Even the darkness is not dark to you. And the night is bright as the day. For darkness is as light with you. Let's just stop right there. For those of you who have not yet understood or understand, but have not yet surrendered to the invitation of God to be forgiven of your sins, turning to his son for such forgiveness, and instead have opted and continued to opt to live as if there's no God. Whether or not you claim to believe that or not, try to functionally live like that. I want you to understand verses 7 to 12, to put us very kindly to you, is like a divine comedy. A divine comedy that's got a conclusion in tragedy. Divine comedy in this sense. For those who try to run from God, and to be honest, Everyone in this room has tried at some point or another. No matter where you go, God is there. I might not be there. Your friends might not be there. Your family might not be there. We all might not be there. You might be seemingly in the darkest of places, seemingly in that sort of moment of complete isolation. And God is right there. Now this, as we're going to see in a minute, this is comforting for the child of God. This should not just be concerning. This should be terrifying for those who want to reject God. Because it's saying there's no place you can go that you cannot escape. Not only his presence, but his accountability to deny his presence. Which takes us to verses 13 to 18. Not only his omniscience, 1 to 6. Not only his omnipresence, verses 7 to 12. Now look at verses 13 to 18, his omnipotence, his power. Uh, verse 13. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. That's right. It's not just some product of biology as the baby comes to pass. It's the Lord creating Look at verse 14. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. It's, it's like this divine gift of God's creation perfectly in his divine will, putting together all of these parts. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance and in your book were written every one of them. What? The days that were formed for me. When as yet there was none of them. That's why he says in verse 17 and 18, how precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I would count them, they are more than the sand. I awake and I am still with you. How about that for an exercise when you go to the beach? Every grain of sand that you can look at, you can step at, that you cannot count. God's ways are Greater than that. God's thoughts, God's plans. He now knows all things and he can be found everywhere. He can do all things. What are the implications for you and for me? We talked about your prayers. Now think about God's promises. 
don't simply be impressed by God. Be comforted or be concerned. I think what's fascinating in Exodus chapter 3, a text we looked at the previous week, God's self-existence in Exodus chapter 3, and Moses asks God, who, who do I say is sending me? Who do I tell them? What, what letter of recommendation? What kind of business card do I give them? And God says, tell them I am who I am, which was a declaration of his self-existence, always having been, always existing, always being. But what's interesting in that context is he says to Moses, just a few verses earlier in verse 12 of Exodus chapter 3, he says, I will be with you. Friends, I don't simply want you to be impressed with these thoughts of divinity. I want you to be comforted by them for those of you who are children of God. Even in those moments when you don't pray like you should, he's still there. This is what makes Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, so profound. Verse 23, it says, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. What's so captivating about the teaching of the Bible is it not only captures the transcendence of God, how he is unlike no other, it also clearly communicates the imminence of God, that he is with us, with us. I mean, you just think with me, look briefly at Romans chapter 8. Oh, what comforting reality is God makes these promises to us. Look at Romans chapter 8. As he's talking about the salvation that they have through faith in Christ, maturing in Christ, he says in verse 31 of Romans 8, What then shall we say to these things? Talking about God's divine purposes in the previous verses. If God is for us, this statement is only meaningful if we get a full picture of who God is. This God is for us. Who could be against us? It's one of those rhetorical questions that already implies the answer. How is he for us? He's not just saying if God is with us. He actually says if God is for us. How is he for us? 32. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised? Who is at the right hand of God? Who is indeed interceding for us? Verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword, as it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Verse 37, no, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Friends, if you are in Christ, this is sweet balm, sweet medicine to your soul. No matter whether or not you feel relationally lonely, 
No matter whether or not you feel personally powerless to change your circumstances, no matter whether or not you might feel like God does not love you because of how you interpret your circumstances, you can go back to the text and go, this is what is true. He has given his son for you. And because of giving his son, he's made a promise to you that nothing can separate you from him. And this takes us to our third understanding of God. Not only is he all-knowing, not only is our God all-powerful, third, and appropriately combined, he is all-powerful. So he is all-knowing, he is all-present, and he is all-powerful. We keep the theme going of his character being all, omni, God being all-powerful, his omnipotence. We've learned a couple of weeks back about God's sovereignty. You can't have sovereignty without his omnipotence. You can't have omnipotence without his sovereignty. He, he is pleased to do whatever he pleases to do. He, he is God. Um, Psalm 115, verse 3. Our God is in the heavens. He does most of what he pleases. He doesn't read that. He does all that he pleases. Jeremiah 32, verse 17. Ah, Lord God, it is you who have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. God doesn't break a sweat. God doesn't get blisters on his hands. He's not weary. He doesn't need to take a drink break. He doesn't have to kind of rest and come back tomorrow and finish his job. He declares it to be and it is so. He simply speaks it and it is so. Creation exists not because he did anything, but because he spoke everything. He said, let it be, and it was so. We can sometimes overstate this point of God's omnipotence by making the statement, God can do anything. It's a well-intended phrase that sometimes overreaches with its language. There are things that God cannot do by his own character. He cannot lie. Titus tells us this. He cannot perform any immoral action because that would be against his perfectly good and holy character. Contradict himself. He cannot do things that are logically contradictory, like he doesn't make round squares, because that contradicts himself, who is truth. Such things do not exist. God's omnipotence is a display of his divinity and all that he does, his power. It's common in marketing today for sport drinks, Gatorade, Vitamin water, Powerade. You can even hear in some of the titles, Aid. They're helping you. Their claim to fame is that they're not just hydrating you with water. They're also providing electrolytes. Electrolytes are these essential minerals, if you will, like potassium, calcium, sodium. You need these in your body. Your organs will not function correctly. If you get tragically sick and other type of issues that can arise, you will either by your choice or by someone else's choice be taken to the ER. And one of the first things they're going to do is they're going to put an IV in you. They're not just putting a medically bagged up thing of water in you. They're putting a kind of a cocktail of chemicals, if you will, a cocktail of provision for your body to be brought back to its fully functioning capacity. God, no need. No electrolytes needed for God. No IV bags for him. No ER that he has to visit. God doesn't take naps. He doesn't need to take a break. Psalm 62 verse 11 says, Once God has spoken, twice I have heard this, that power belongs to God. I like how John Frame says it. We have it here for you. John Frame says, I think the most helpful definition of God's omnipotence is this, that he has complete and total control 
over everything. And this includes the smallest details of the natural world, like the falling of a sparrow or the number of hairs that grow on your head. Even the events we call random, that we ascribe to chance, are really God at work. That includes not only the small things, but also the big things, which, after all, are accumulations of small things. He determines what nations will dwell in which territory. He decides what kings, what king is to rule and when and where. He decides whether the purposes of a ruler will stand or fall. And he decided once that wicked people would take the life of his dear son so that we sinners might live. And this brings us to our third implication of the attributes of God here. And not only your prayers and God's promises, also God's payment. Look at Acts chapter 2 with me. It's a significant text because here's what I think some of you understandably, but I mean this politely, wrongly believe about God. You understandably believe wrongly that God wishes things would be different. But God being polite as he is, he's a gentleman, if you will. He doesn't want to violate people's wills. And so people, unfortunately, make all kinds of bad decisions. He's a polite God. He kind of lets them cut him off in traffic, if you will. He doesn't think it's good. He thinks it's reckless. He sees where they're headed, and sometimes they get into a collision. He's disappointed by the decision, but hey, he let you drive the automobile wherever you chose. We think this is a good way to think about God because it kind of lets God not appear to be concerningly at fault for anything bad that happens. Because, understandably, if that would be true, we'd be concerned that God is not good. God is not holy. So it's our way to kind of preserve the holiness of God, the goodness of God, and yet still recognize the brokenness in the world as if somehow God is like, man, I, I'm so sorry. But they, well, they were them. And you know, you kind of know what that's like at times too. You've made some bad decisions, and I try to help you. But hey, but don't panic. We can still make a wrong thing right. We can still kind of clean up an aisle too and help get this thing in the right direction again. Just give me a minute. Okay, God, I want to be patient with you. That's how a lot of people, including Christians, by default think of God. The problem is nothing in Scripture actually teaches that. Not a consistent, clear reading of that. And there's probably no greater place to sort of see this than ground zero for seemingly the most wicked thing that could ever be taken place. Not your life, though I trust many things that you've received perhaps have been very wicked. Or my life, and I feel those personally and painfully, but against the son of God's life. Now look at Acts chapter two. What's happening in Acts chapter two after the Spirit of God comes upon them in the beginning of Acts chapter 2, Peter preaches this biblically saturated sermon. And he kind of declares from the prophet Joel what Joel said was going to happen is happening. And then he says in verse 22, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth a man attested to you by God. How was he attested? With mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. You can't deny it. You saw it with your own eyes. As you yourselves know, verse 23, this Jesus delivered up according to the Definite 
plan, and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pains of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. He goes on to say more in the sermon. What I want to point out to you is in verse 23 and 24, what appears to be a tension in our own thinking is not a tension in God's thinking, which is divine sovereignty and human responsibility. Jesus is delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God that Peter holds them responsible for, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. And to be clear, God holds them responsible for what they willingly, desiringly did themselves. This is why later on he would call them to respond when they asked the question in verse 37. Look at what it says here in verse 37. How do they respond? Brothers, what shall we do? Asking this question to Peter. And Peter said to him, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, why is this so significant? Because when it comes to the idea of God's omnipotence, his all-powerful reality of his reign, it says even in the midst of broken and tragic choices, God is still producing, God is still orchestrating, God is still planning to bring about all things for the good of his people and for the glory of his name which is honestly why you and I sleep every night. Because if we believe that God is somehow being surprised, God is somehow being absent, or God is somehow being too weak, then friends, we're not reading the scriptures that describes who the reality of who God is. And so what we see here is there is a responsibility that we see that we have. But here's the key, and this is why I say the third feature here about the implication, God's payment. God made payment for your biggest problem, which is rebellion against him, and that payment was in his son, Jesus Christ. How do you know this God? You don't know him by simply studying him as a sum of features, like an academic subject, like you'd study trigonometry or calculus, biology or anatomy. You know God by knowing his son, Jesus said, he who has seen me has seen the Father. For I and the Father are one. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Friends, for those of you who are in Christ, you can take confidence that God is all-powerful in your life, accomplishing his plans for you, calling you to respond in faith. But even if your faith is not as perfect as you wish it would be, he has still made payment because of your surrendering to his son. And that invitation stands to everybody else in this room still this morning. How does man believe? Because he has been born again. What's the call for you to do? To believe. To believe in the all-knowing, all-present, all-powerful God.